Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar pro provided to you today from Dunhill Financial and Black Swan Capital Europe. We're delighted you could join us this afternoon. We're going to go through a presentation specifically for Americans and US connected individuals living in the Netherlands specifically and across the EU uh, and in regards of what's happening in the financial markets, what it means for you and some uh, perhaps some ideas and minutes over that benefit to you. Can we go to the next slide, please. So we're going to pause on this one for a moment, the one that many people skip over. It is important just to remind you this is a, a webinar provided uh, by Dunhill and Black Swan Capital free of charge. It is informational only. So we hope you find it useful. We hope you find it relevant. And if something in particular seems of relevance to you, please go and speak to the relevant financial professional to get advice specific to your circumstances. Thank you. So what we're going to go through today, uh, before we talk about that, a bit about who we are, Black Swan Capital. Uh, my name is David Bellinger. I'm the CEO of Black Swan Capital, joined here today by Edward Mannering Burton, our Director of Hi. Advice and General Manager across the Netherlands. And we have a number of our other colleagues uh, on screen there. And in the next slide, a little bit about us. We're, we're based in Amsterdam on the Herengracht. Uh, we're an independent, uh, and licensed investment advisory firm regulated under the Dutch financial regulator, the AFM, and overseen by the Dutch Central Bank. We're an independent fee-for-service operation that specializes in helping expats and international professionals in general, and Americans and US-connected individuals in particular. Over to you, Ed. Thanks very much, David. Uh, so today we are joined by uh, Brian Dunhill, who is the CEO of Dunhill Financial, which is uh, a firm that specializes in providing portfolio management services and uh, discretionary portfolio models to US connected individuals around the world. Uh, so I think we, we can see Brian. I, I believe you're online. Are you there, Brian? I am here. Excellent. Right. It's a pleasure to be joined by you today. Um, as David said, we're here to talk about the different aspects of financial management and personal finance that are affecting expats like ourselves around the world today, but more specifically here in the EU. Um, so we really would like to have this as interactive as possible. We can see there are quite a lot of you logged on now. Um, those of you that are listening, please feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of the page. So if you move your mouse slightly, you'll see there's a, a speech bubble uh, at the bottom of the screen, which says chat. And if you have any questions, if there's anything that's playing on your mind, anything that you'd really like addressed, then please do type it in there and we'll get to that straight away. We'll try and go through these questions in order where we can, and uh, we'll refer to our slides and the tools that we've got wherever we can. And of course, bring in Brian's expertise to help with the questions that are really going to matter to you. Uh, you can see there that Brian's just launched a message. That's exactly where you can type in and we will reply to you directly through the screen. So we're going to talk about anything that you have that you'd like us to address, but also what's happened in the last 12 months. As we all know, it's been a very, very turbulent time for investors and for investments around the world. We saw the accumulation of two big events at the end of February last year, almost a year to the day now ago, where we saw the combination of the coronavirus starting to spread across the EU, and of course, the the oil price war going on between uh, between Russia and Saudi, and the culmination, the combination of those two events caused a big crash that we're just really recovering from now. But of course, a lot of us are still sitting on lockdown and wondering how long this is all going to go on for. So once we've touched on that a bit, we're going to go a bit more into the fundamentals of investing, the fundamentals of being an investor how we should all be managing our money and looking at our financial goals, and then how we can make that into a target, make that into a portfolio that's going to work for us over time. We'll, of course, also be looking at key issues that affect American investors or US-connected investors. We're very well aware that you don't have to be an American citizen 
to be affected by the regulations and the legislation that is put in place in order to make sure that US tax compliance is applied to anybody who has a reporting duty to the IRS. David. Yes, thank you, Ed. Let's look, at, look back a little bit before we look forward. So uh, on the next slide, we're just going to cover a reminder if, if we needed one perhaps of, of what's gone on if we move forward to uh, an overview of one of the aspects that defined 2020 and took us to now. On the next slide, you'll see uh, government and central bank support and what that meant. So in rather an extraordinary period of time in the last year, we saw in a rather coordinated approach across the EU, across the US, the UK, and many countries around the world where central banks basically printed a whole lot of money. They stimulated the economy to protect it from the downturns associated with the lockdowns of, of COVID-19, that restrictions of travel, restrictions of business, and to avoid uh, business failures, to avoid industry failures and, and large unemployment, a lot of money was pumped into the economies. And we've just got a summary of that there, uh, rather unprecedented in the amounts that went through. It's still going on with the US government talking about it right now. And this had quite a, a substantial impact. There was, if you, if you do go forward, uh, a personal impact and a, and a global and a national impact as well. Uh, we saw in the early days various forms of support depending on the country in which you were living and how that might have impacted you, whether as a small business owner, uh, as an employee, uh, as part of a large corporation, and, and how those various supports might have helped you. Uh, we will talk a bit further about that and what that impact means, because with all that money being injected into the economy, it does place pressures in the markets uh, and in the, the financial world, and, and that can impact your money, your investments, and your outlooks. Uh, just go on to the next slide, please. Ed, do you want to cover this one about the euro stocks? Yeah, certainly. So if we're looking at the, the euro stocks, which is an index which is designed to give an approximation of the European economy. So it, it picks out indicative stocks that, uh, that represent a particular industry or a particular sector in the EU. And if we look at this graph, this shows us the performance over the past few years on the Euro stocks 50. Now, we can see that for the whole of 2020, it actually finished negative. Now, this is different from what we saw in some, uh, some other major indices. The US in particular actually finished positive for the year 2020 and bounced back from the big crash at the end of February, start of March. Um, the, the Euro stocks we can see over the whole 12 months from, uh, from the end of February last year to right now is pretty much wiping its nose it's back where it started but as with most stock markets around the world there was a very very steep recovery so the the period where we saw the biggest crash from the end of february into march 2020 was the fastest 20 percent drop in global markets that we had ever seen it it just absolutely plummeted but then we had one of the fastest recoveries ever seen. And so April for the US was actually the best month that they had on record since the 80s. And we can see that there's still a lot of potential for growth in Europe, as long as this coordination and as long as this, this reopening and recovery continues to work, David. Thank you, Ed. And it also shows and reinforces, I think, a couple of points about stock markets in general and, and investing in general. If you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll look at it in the context of the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is one of the measures of the, the New York Stock Exchange Index, and we're looking at it over a larger time period in the uh, top left over 10 years and in the bottom right over 25 years. And it reinforces a couple of, a couple of points. One, that fall that Ed described from February, late February through to March 19 in 2020, was a very substantial drop. You can see it there. The recovery was faster than most uh, drops we've seen, but it reinforces the point that over time, markets do head up. They, they go up, but just not in a straight line. It reminds us that um, things that go up must come down and things that are going down must come up. So 
it gives us some perspective. I, I, I think it's important here to say that over those two time periods, you can see that there's been other, other market collapses as well. On the bottom right-hand side, you can see the 2008 crash. And what looks smaller now is the 2000 to 2002 uh, market crashes on the NASDAQ and then through the, um, the Enron and other crises in, in New York and, and the New York Stock Exchange as well. So you can see that markets will go through their ups and downturns, but will trend towards the positive. And the relevance of this for investors is to keep in mind on where you're investing and the relevance of that to your longer term goals. You know, if we look at, if we go forward just quickly, uh, I'm going to skip this slide and go on to the next one and, and talk a little bit about other aspects of investment. And when markets turn uh, uncertain, there is what we call a flight to security. The best measure of that is gold. And you can see that when, when there is any uncertainty uh, globally, economically, politically, gold prices will go up. As confidence uh, increases, those prices will ease off again. So for a hard and stable asset, it is actually quite volatile. But it's a good measure to get a sense of what sort of volatility exists in the market. It last rallied just before the US election results came out in November and has come off a bit since then. Uh, over to you, Ed. Yeah, well, we know that there's been a lot going on. And I mentioned earlier, if we go on to the next slide, that there were two key events that, uh, that combined in February of last year to create the economic situation and the financial situation that we, that we saw that really defined 2020 for all investors. That it was the culmination of this oil price war. And uh, we saw in the news that the, the oil futures market actually went negative for a short period in March 2020, which was unheard of and certainly un, uh, unexpected. But that combined with coronavirus really impacted everybody. And so the key for investors was making sure that they weren't just reacting to that, but that they understood it was part of their, their financial life, part of their, their journey in order to reach their financial goals. Now, we as a company at Black Swan are 100% focused on target-based investment. We don't believe in uh, taking a pot of money and thinking, how many percent could I make from that? It's all about looking at what the end result is going to be. Now, uh, Dunhill Financial that I mentioned earlier, who are joining us here, are one of the providers of discretionary portfolio management uh, that we turn to in order to provide the investment decisions on portfolios for clients of ours. So what we'd like to do right now is bring Brian in to talk a bit more about how, how he and his company have, have dealt with the last 12 months since this impact happened, this, this black swan event that you might call it, the, the black swan event being the culmination of the two predictable events at exactly the same time. So Brian, if you'd like to talk to us a bit about how, as a company, uh, Dunhill Financial has, has worked in reaction to the, to the crash of 2020 and working through making sure that your clients are are growing beyond that. Absolutely, thank, thank you, Edward, and, and thank you, David, for, for the introduction. Um, we have always had what we call a core plus satellite model to our portfolio. Uh, the core of our portfolio is always gonna be a minimum 80% of the portfolio, and these are gonna be our long-term positions, uh, mostly indexes and the such. Our satellites last year became the biggest that they ever have which maximizes at 20%. So last year we made some big shifts in our portfolio uh, of which for the first time in the last decade, we actually underweighted the US dollar instead of being overweight for the last decade. It came to fruition, that the dollar topped out in August. Probably everybody on this call is well aware of that because we think about the dollar to the Euro more than most people would. Um, we also started getting out of some of our structures that we didn't know or didn't know how they were gonna react or didn't have confidence in how they would react. Uh, so right now, um, since last March, we're on 0% real estate inside of our portfolios. We've seen real estate recover half of what it did. And when I'm talking about real estate, I'm not talking about the lovely house on the canals 
uh, that you get. I'm not talking residential. I'm talking about hotels, um, retail establishments, and other office buildings, which we would buy inside of the portfolio. We've reduced that down to nothing because we don't know how it's going to behave post-COVID. Um, we can only imagine that things will change in the near term and pricing should be different, um, but we didn't feel comfortable knowing that those were expensive prices. We shifted a lot of those assets into some of our favorite e-commerce plays and payment platforms, which has come out great. The last piece that we've gone into has been in renewable energies, and we love renewable energies inside of our portfolio because, first of all, it's on the right side of history. And second of all, we know that we're going to get a lot of those government stimulus payments going into new infrastructure payments like David was talking about. Biden is on the verge of, of uh, uh, getting $1.9 trillion worth of, of uh, stimulus in the United States. And a big majority of that, probably nearly 50%, will go towards infrastructure spending. And that will go to some of these renewable energy companies. So we're, we're going with those segments that do well no matter what. We're not just going on a whim on this. Um, this well, we hear the politicians constantly saying that this is an unprecedented event. Uh, that is not really true. We've had nine epidemics in the last two decades, and they just happen to be more out in the East. So we can look at things like SARS back in 2003 and see how they affected Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and the mix. And we're using those as our case studies to say, how will things behave at this point in time and how will they behave in recovery? We've stayed away from healthcare, which has been a big, big investment for a lot of people in consumer staples and how Pfizer behaved back in November where they recovered. Um, they did really well when, um, when uh, essentially they announced the vaccine, but they reverted right back to their means within a few weeks. Um, we know that these are story stocks right now, but we don't expect them to explode as we get back into recovery in the next couple of years. So having the long-term perspective, but making those small nuances in between to try to avoid risk, we're a big believer that if we, if we manage the risk properly, the performance comes by itself. That's great to hear. Thank you, Brian. Now, uh, David, we, we mentioned the issues that individual investors can face as Americans. Uh, but we wanted to talk a bit about more of the, the fundamentals for any investor. Could you, could you tell us some of that? Thank you, Adrian. Let's go through some fundamentals. This, we'll do it in two components, as you've said, fundamentals that apply to everyone, and then some specific aspects that in particular for US connected individuals and American citizens uh, living here in, in this part of the world. So if we can move forward to the next slide, I just want to go rather quickly through a, a, a few key components here. The first is about um, managing inflation. And we think this is really important. Linking it back um, to the, the point we made earlier uh, about the increase in government spending, the central banks uh, injecting money into the, into the markets. And as Brian just mentioned, that 1.9 trillion that's about to hit the, the US, this puts pressure on inflation which means interest rates can go higher. The higher interest rates are, the more it can erode your spending power over time. So it's really important to consider this. And on the graph here, we're looking at a historical period where interest rates were much higher. But in that period of 20 years from 86, um, sorry, 30 years from 86 through to 16, you can see that uh, purchasing power more than halved in that period. So your spending power eroded quite strongly. It's important to keep that in mind. And if you jump to the next slide, there's a rather simple way you can keep track of it in your own mind by following the rule of 72. This is a nice way to see the impact of inflation or the, the growth of an investment over time. Looking at the top left-hand corner there, if inflation was to sit around 3% per annum, that would mean using that rule of 72, 72 divided by 3%, that your purchasing power on an amount of money would halve effectively over 24 years. So if you thought you might want to retire on 5,000 euros a month in 24 years time, in today's money, you might actually need double that, 10,000. And just bringing that together and looking at inflation on the next, next uh, slide, 
this is where inflation has been at in, in recent times. The central banks in Europe and the US and the UK particularly like inflation between two and 3%. They have a much lower tolerance for high inflation that they had in the past. However, they're going to be under pressure, we think in the, in the medium term, as the, the impacts of this uh, spending uh, flows through the economy. So a couple of things will happen. We think interest rates may increase a bit. That's going to put more pressure on you as an investor in terms of keeping pace with inflation, having uh, cash in the bank, earning no interest is going to hurt you more in the long term. Uh, and to the limit that they will control inflation, it needs other outlets. If they don't, if the central banks don't allow inflation to get too high, if they do keep it to around that 3% mark, it may manifest in other areas over time. That might in the medium term come out in terms of taxes, uh, exchange rates, or indeed be kicked down the road to the next government as, as, uh, as may well happen. Thanks. And then to the next slide. The other point I just want to mention quickly before I jump back to Ed is that uh, just in terms of making sure we're all speaking the same language, if you like, that when we're talking about investments and different types of investments, in general, the higher the short term risk of an investment, the higher the longer term return. In the bottom left hand corner, treasury bills is a bit like having your money in the bank. You don't expect there to be much risk. Indeed, there are sometimes protections around losing money, against losing money, and the returns at the moment are about zero. Indeed, for larger values, they are indeed negative in some European markets. As you move up through fixed interest, which is government and corporate bonds, the risks are still low. If you can remember uh, any news reports from 2008-9 of saying a country defaulted on their loans, that would be a government bond where they didn't pay it back. It's so exceptional, it makes the news. So it typically is considered a lower, lower risk investment for large uh, countries and large uh, companies where you invest your money with them on a loan basis and receive a coupon or income payment before receiving your capital back, as opposed to investing in stocks, which is another word for shares, also called equities, uh, in which case you're invested in stock markets typically, which have uh, a chance of going up or down, that risk is reduced over time. So when we're talking about investment management, we're talking about a portfolio combination of those. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, David. Yeah, so moving on to the next slide, one thing that we're asked quite a lot is what would be an ideal portfolio for me? Now, of course, we have to be individual about this. We have to look at your goals and your targets in order to, in order to put together an investment structure and an investment balance that's going to work towards your objectives. But what we've got here are just some, some massive generalizations to, to give you an idea of how that might be built up. So we're gonna look at the, the moderate portfolio in the middle. So here is an investor who has 50% in stocks or equities or shares or whatever you want to call them, 40% into bonds or fixed interest, and then 10% kept in cash. Of course, if you look above and below, the conservative has more in fixed interest, more in cash and less in stocks. And then the more aggressive portfolio has more in stocks because, as David said, they might have higher volatility, but they would then be expected to produce higher returns over the long term. Now, the problem for a lot of investors comes when they simply allow their portfolio to, to do its thing on its own. So we're going to imagine that somebody who's got one of these moderate portfolios, as you see in the middle there, with 50% in equities, 40% in bonds, and 10% in cash. Then we're going to take a real period of time from history, from recent history, and show how that would affect that portfolio. So looking at the next slide here, you can see that that 50% in stocks at the start the equivalent of $50,000, euros, whatever it might be. We've just used round numbers here to make it simple. Now, we took the five weeks uh, up to March the 20th of 2020. Now, in this situation, we had a big crash in the US market. Now, during those five weeks, the S&P 500, the, the list of the 500 largest stocks by market capitalization in the US dropped by 29%. So that meant that $50,000 or euros that you started with is now worth only 35 and a half. 
the US bond index dropped by 3% over the same five week period. So in that month, it dropped from $40,000 to 38,900. And of course, the cash stayed the same over that five weeks as we would expect. Now, look at the column on the right and look at how this has affected the balance of this investor's portfolio. So that 50% that was in stocks has now dropped to 42% relatively because of the bigger effect. The 40% that was in bonds has jumped up to 46% of the whole portfolio. And the cash is now 12%. So that's 20% more than the allocation that this investor wanted. So in a situation where markets are down, then there's an opportunity to generate growth from that. There's an opportunity to buy that value. So we should be looking to take a little bit more risk in order to build a recovery from a crash. But by doing nothing, this investor has actually made themselves less aggressive in terms of their portfolio. So by increasing the, the percentage of cash and the percentage of fixed interest and decreasing the percentage of equities, that has become a much more cautious portfolio overall. So by doing nothing, this investor has actually gone in the wrong direction relative to their own goals and targets. So we're going to bring in Brian again here uh, just to talk about how this works with a discretionary manager. So one of the reasons that we, we use discretionary fund management is so that these decisions can be made on a day-to-day -day basis by a team of professionals with complex analysis behind them uh, in order to provide this, this rebalancing and this ongoing change and work for the individual client or investor. So Brian, um, why don't you talk to us a bit about how that works in practice for, for an investor with one of your models? Absolutely, thank you, Edward. Um, so all of our portfolios are broken down into a grouping of different securities. We keep all the securities in the United States so that we meet all the, uh, the PFIC rules and the such, but we rebalance them accordingly. So the majority of our trading will typically happen closer to year end for tax reasons. This is for tax harvesting. But when there are events during the year that establish that we should be moving the portfolio, we're gonna take care of those as need be. Um, so we're always analyzing the portfolio and always analyzing the markets. When we look at our portfolios, they have all beaten their benchmarks. The main reason that we've beaten those benchmarks is because we've done really well on the currencies. And those, as we know, have established, as we, we, we pre-established, um, have shifted in a big way as of last August. So we wanna make sure that we take into account those parameters. And we wanna make sure that in years like last year, that we don't just rest on our laurels and we don't forget to rebalance the portfolio to get them back into the risk metric that you need. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, so David, coming back to the, the fundamentals for individual investors, we've, we've talked a lot about target-based investment and uh, making sure that we're focusing on the goals and the objectives rather than uh, just chasing immediate returns. Um, how, would you, how would you describe that to the the average person who comes to us and says uh, well where should i put my money thanks yeah that's a really good question if you go to the next slide we've got that slide with all the questions on it there if you look at the next slide it's a good uh, measure to just to um to demonstrate and illustrate that if you just push through a couple of times to get all the lines on the screen there it's really about working out that position of where you are now and where you want to be and the best way to get there. So that gap analysis of understanding where you need to be relative to where you are. So it's it's a really important exercise that your goals and your objectives drive what you need to achieve. So in one measure, it might be that you take the lowest risk necessary to get the return you need, or you make the adjustments to get you towards your goals. And you can see there on the screen that the green line might be where you want to get to from today. Uh, the, the purple line in the middle, what you can afford, and uh, the blue line, what your risk tolerance allows. And if you're in that reality where there is a gap, you need to work out how you can make up that gap. That might be by taking more time. It might be by reevaluating what's important to you and what goals you, you need to take. Or it might be by reassessing your risk 
profile. The reality is the red line. And that really reasserts that with all this good planning, uh, life doesn't happen in a straight line. Uh, in, in all situations, the the best plans will, will not stay still for, for 20 years and neither they should. They should be reassessed every, every six or 12 months and made sure they're still in line with your goals, just as the portfolio that Dunhill managed and, and as we've been talking about, will be making those same readjustments. Starting with that question, is this investment still aligned to help me achieve my long-term objectives? The investment being uh, the means to the end of, of realizing those. And so it's really about that ongoing management to see if you, you have that alignment. And, and that pieces together in, in a number of other external factors on the next slide that really uh, contribute to you doing that. So it's not just about the investment, the investment in the context of managing investment risk and managing your risk is one component. We need to consider things like taxes, the taxes of where you are living, the tax, any other jurisdictions in which you may have tax obligations. Pertinent to US connected people is the tax reporting that you have to do every year, making sure that your investments are tax compliant. As we mentioned before, and what will be more important in the next five years is inflation, considering that. And of course, then there's human problems, the things that we potentially cannot control. Uh, it might be sickness or illness, inability to work, uh, changing life focus and other externalities that could really drive the way you invest and, and the way you um, achieve your goals and indeed what the goals might be. So it's you need to look at it more broadly, not just the specific return that I'm getting relative to a, a market index. The other factor that I would mention in that context, if we look at the next slide, this is another fundamental of investing that we think is important. And it's there, there are a number of investor biases that we, we always uh, keep, uh, keep aware of. And this one is an interesting one. We've seen some great examples of this, uh, great in a, in a rather broad definition, in the last year, particularly earlier this year, where a, a, a default position could be to buy at a high and sell at a low by being captivated by a momentum of an investment. So watching it over time, seeing that it looks interesting, and waiting till you've got that proof of past performance, which is, of course, is no guarantee of future performance uh, before deciding to buy in. And I'll buy now while they're hot, as the graph says. And whether you buy or sell or hold, when inevitably a market does turn down, people will, may go through that period of, of hoping it will bounce and then sort of some resignation waiting for them to recover before they, they uh, ex uh, expire and run out of that tolerance. And so I've had enough now, I'm going to sell. This was the risk inflated in, in that period of February, March last year, when markets were falling. And there were a couple of key lessons that, that we like to share when this happens in markets. One of those is when you hear in the, in the, in the press mostly, this time it's different. That's a really good measure for us to think, well, maybe we're at the, towards the end of one of these sharp cycles. And getting towards mid-March, we're hearing this time it's different, it's going to, to fall forever. Just like in 1999, we heard this time it's different, the NASDAQ's going to rise forever before it crashed in March 2000. When you hear that, it's always a time for caution and a good idea to act contrary to what the market's doing. And going what, in terms of what I referenced a few slides earlier, by sticking to the core principles and the reasons why you're investing, it can help remove you from these, um, these investor biases, such as the momentum bias. Quite right. And another very important thing to, to point out from this chart that we've got in front of us, if you're looking at the different points on this, this curve showing where investor bias comes into play, then you're missing the overarching reason for this chart. If you look at the far left hand side and the far right hand side, the trend is upwards. So if you're in it for the long term and working towards your goals, then you really shouldn't be paying too much attention to these individual points and how they might be affecting you. If you're day trading and trying to make a quick profit over and over and over again, then that's not a long-term goal, really. That's, that's a goal that should act on its own. But we have to look at your targets, your objectives, and how investments can work towards those. Now, we've talked quite a bit about, uh, about US connected individuals and the, the, specific, uh, the specific 
factors that are affecting uh, US individuals around the world and expats who want to invest. Um, so if we could just go to slide 37, please. And no, that's not the right one at all. So instead of that, we'll go back to the slide that we were on and I'll pass back to you, David. Thanks, Ed. From that slide, when we get to that, we're going to talk a little bit about the situation of, of US connected people. We're going to go up about four or five slides from there. And that's a good one to stop on. That was the one I was after. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about here. And the first point when we're talking about uh, US connected individuals, US citizens living in this part of the world is defining who is a US connected person. Because as Ed said earlier, the net is broader than just someone with a US passport. And this is relevant if you're a spouse of a US citizen and you can see some other definitions there as well. You may have uh, been born outside the US with uh, a US citizen parent. You may have been born in the US when your parents were expats there from other countries. And we've seen a couple of high profile cases, uh, Boris Johnson, for which I don't think many people had great sympathy when he had to pay tax on the sale of a house in the UK because he had a US passport. Now that led him to go and uh, give back his US citizenship, which is a rather big decision to make and then has lots of implications around it. But it, the example is that it is a broad net under which you could inadvertently be captured if you're not sure of what constitutes a, a, a US connected person, sometimes called an accidental American. Quite right. And as David says, it's not just US citizens who are affected. Uh, we're finding a lot of uh, a lot of US connected individuals are, as David says, these accidental Americans. And so these are people who might not even realize that they have a liability to the IRS. And therefore they could be unknowingly investing in a non-compliant way and opening themselves up to potential aggressive taxation or, uh, or even penalties, financial and legal, in the US at some point in the future, which of course we have to avoid. That's gonna really damage any financial plans that you've got. So uh, Dunhill Financial is one of the discretionary fund managers that we, uh, that we turn to uh, because they have this specialized knowledge of managing portfolios for US taxpayers or US connected individuals outside the United States. So I'm gonna call Brian back again now. Um, Brian, could you talk to us a bit about some of the, the key concerns for, for US connected investors and how you as a, as a discretionary management company work to address those and to manage a portfolio for somebody who has those, those key issues with their own investments? Absolutely. Um, there's a few things that you really need to concentrate on when you're American abroad. Um, one of the first things is that you don't want to make your U.S. taxes worse off by investing in localized investments. This is what's called the PFIC issue or the passive foreign investment company issue. If you own any collective investment in the Netherlands or any place else that is not a pension, automatically the United States is going to tax that in a negative manner. Some accountants will find a little bit better ways to, to account for it, but at the end of the day, you're going to pay more tax than if you just owned in U.S. securities. Now, in Europe, we also have another set of rules that are the MIFID rules, and MIFID, while it doesn't offer the penalties of PFIX, means that if you own U.S. mutual funds, you are probably not compliant in Europe. And now, to quote Joseph Heller, where he said, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not after me. I'm worried that one day a European government will start to go after us for owning mutual funds in the States um, because they can tax us in that negative way and they can use those PFIC issues. So we don't want to be using U.S. mutual funds. We don't want to be using European USITs or even European exchange traded funds because those would be considered PFICs. So we invest in the United States. And that means that we get our 1099 document. The 1099 makes it as easy as possible to do our US taxes. It means that we don't have to worry about doing an FBAR, the FBAR being that reporting for any account that's over $10,000 that's abroad to the US Treasury. Um, if the account's in the United States, we don't have to file it. Uh, we also know that our money is safe 
We're in the structures that co are covered by FDIC coverage, SIPC coverage, and the, our actual account is ring fenced to where even when Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns failed in 2008, all those accounts shifted over Lehman Brothers over to Barclays Wealth Management, Bear Stearns over to JP Morgan, and they were all fully intact. So we know that we have those protection mechanisms. The last one that I love is that the fees on most products in the United States are cheaper there than they are in Europe. So this isn't all bad news. This is essentially, we get a cheaper product that uh, essentially conforms with both sides of the jurisdiction. We need to make sure that we pay attention to those. Thank you very much. Um, so there are, there are key things to look at as an investment company if you're providing these solutions to American investors. Um, what do you feel, Brian, are are the differences that you would you would see between uh, European investment attitudes and American investment attitudes? That's a wonderful question because there there's a vast difference between the, the two sets, and that's why we start to use different um, tools inside of our portfolio. You'll hear some people talk about how you should just invest passively in their portfolios. Uh, now, if I was in the United States and I knew I was going to retire in the United States, I might have a more passive portfolio. And even when we're investing for the U.S. portion of our portfolios, we use that passive element because there's a very dynamic market that back in the 90s when financials were doing great, that made up the biggest part of the S&P 500. Now, 23% of the S&P 500 is made up of by five stocks, you know all the fangs, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. So with that dynamic marketplace, you can invest a little more passively in the United States. But when we're investing in Europe, which somebody that's going to be retiring in Europe should have a bigger portion of their investments in euros to avoid some of that currency risk. If we invested passively, we saw the charts that, that um, uh, David and Edward showed us earlier on the Euro 50. It is not as dynamic as a market. Our biggest investments would be mostly banks and automotives. We're in a recession. Banks and automotives are not the most attractive thing. So we end up using other vehicles. They're not fully active, but they're not fully passive. We end up using what are called thematics. And thematics invest the most in the companies that are growing the most instead of the companies that happen to be the largest. For instance, we just saw the shareholder reports, uh, uh, the, the, the annual uh, reports for, um, for Spotify. Um, they did a whole theme on uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, which I learned that that was actually the first album that didn't have a single. You were supposed to listen to it all in full. And that is exactly what Spotify is trying to do with their earnings. To bring that back, Spotify has been growing at the same speed as those things, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. But Spotify is a fraction of the size of it. So it's not as big of a part of the index if we buy the raw index. But when we buy the thematic index, we get a bigger portion of these technology companies that are doing really well here in Europe, but still not at the same size as the things in the United States. So that becomes a nice tool that we can use and we should think about things differently so that we're getting the representation into technology stocks, e-commerce stocks, uh, renewable energy stocks that really represent the indexes in the United States that we like, but we can get them here in Europe as well. Thank you very much, Brian. We've just had a question come in from, uh, from David Whitehead who's asked, um, is there any legislation on the horizon in the US or the EU that will challenge or restrict expats more than is currently the case. So something along the lines of FATCA. Now, uh, thanks very much for your question, David. The, the simple answer to this is both no and yes, depending on where you're talking about and what the day or the time of day is. At any point around the world, there is always the potential for aggressive or passive legislation to be passed or taken back. One thing that we've we've certainly seen uh, over the past 12 months is that when governments want to, they can move really, really quickly. 
And so this is certainly something that we see with, with tax and financial legislation. So the examples over the past 12 months have been in reaction to the coronavirus pandemic. Governments around the world have managed to put in place uh, new regulations, restrictions or funding for individual projects or, uh, or structures or infrastructure at the drop of a hat. Now, this at the same time as being very reassuring in a crisis is always also a little concerning for anybody who uh, who is looking at how legislation and jurisdiction will affect their investments. And so we always have to think in terms of what if. So when we're advising a client, we'll look at the, the what ifs, the, the known unknowns, if you will. And it's something that David touched on earlier on in the presentation today. These, um, these hurdles that you have to get over, things like uh, future taxation, inflation, um, market risk and volatility. And we have to understand that these things are going to happen. On top of that, there are going to be the black swan events that we spoke about earlier, which unsurprisingly is where we, where we get the name of our company. And so looking at these things as potential for the future rather than categorical, categorical uh, certainties gives us the ability to, to look past them and plan for the longer term. So we don't know of any, in, any particular legislation in the EU or the USA that would look a lot like FATCA but there's always the potential for it to happen. There is nothing to say, as Brian discussed, that an individual European nation or the European government itself as a whole would not in the future turn around and say, uh, anybody who doesn't, who's holding assets that are not MIFID compliant, we're going to tax you aggressively just the way that the US would if you were holding PFIX. So, no, we don't know of it at the moment, but yes, there is always the potential for it. David, do you have anything to add there? I think it's a good point. It's a very pertinent question. You know, just today we've had talks of the South African government talking about imposing a wealth tax to cater for COVID. So there is the, a chance that it can happen, as you say, but there is nothing specifically at this time. We don't foresee anything at this time uh, that is likely to come up in that manner. I'd love to jump in on there and, and, and give some good news on, on, on some of the sides on the American side. And, and very well said, David, on, on the European side. Uh, I'm not trying to make people more paranoid about uh, what's going on. It's more just a, a cautious tone on how we manage the assets. But um, we do have, I, I sit on the advisory board for American citizens abroad, and we do have our own lobbyists. Lobbyists are not always the bad guys. Uh, Mary Louise Serrato, uh, is our lobbyist in DC and she represents these types of instruments for us as Americans abroad and trying to make things better. Uh, the first thing ACA worked on was back in the 70s, it got us as American citizens brought, uh, abroad the right to vote. And just a few weeks ago, uh, Dunhill Financial, including ACA, uh, AARO, which is Association of American Residents Overseas, um, and many other accounting firms and investment firms started the residency-based taxation coalition. So essentially, we started trying to unify, to work together, to try to make uh, a coalition to work with Mary Louise and all the other groups um, in, in advocating towards making our lives simpler as Americans abroad. Great stuff, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, we've had another question come in. Um, so Oliver, you've asked about Brian mentioning mutual funds earlier. So the question is, uh, how do you feel about investing in US mutual funds uh, through a European bank account? Is it safe from a tax perspective because it's a US based fund? So I'm gonna pass this one over to you, Brian. Yeah, um, so at this point in time, there's no additional problems towards owning that, that mutual fund in the United States. From a taxable basis, it's not going to add any elements. The only reason that we suggest our clients to move from mutual funds over to exchange traded funds is because under our examination of MIFID, uh, the, the rules that uh, collectively unify all the European countries, financial rules, that would not meet those MIFID guidelines. 
So if you were going to have a negative tax ramification, it would hit a mutual fund before it would hit an ETF or an individual stock. So at this point in time, it's not a tax problem. We're just trying to, to look forward for potential icebergs that could come in our way. And what we know is that we would just fall into a, a Murphy's Law situation where the year we would have to sell out of that would be the year that you have your biggest taxable year. So we'd rather go ahead and slowly shift out of that. That doesn't mean we sell everything in a mutual fund to put it and be fully uh, MIFID compliant. The strategy that we would normally take is we'd say, turn off the re reinvestment of capital gains and dividends. Most of the time with US carriers, it's automatic that it reinvests those. When you get those cash, use that to diversify out and then use whether you have credits uh, back in the States to where you can um, keep your taxes down, or if you don't stay in lower levels and sell off in tranches over the course of time to get it so that you're fully MIFID compliant. That is the, the most conservative way to deal with those types of positions. That's a good point. Just, just to finish up on that, I think it's worth commenting that in a lot of situations that we see where it isn't absolutely clear, uh, the regulations around FATCA in particular will lead major institutions to err on the side of caution and say to the, the individual that they won't take them on just to make sure that they do remain compliant because they will incur a lot of the, the penalties themselves. We have a couple of more questions coming through. Um, uh, and while we're reading those through, uh, Brian, can we, would you like to expand then a bit more about what's going on at Dunhill and, and how you're um, projecting the year ahead? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll go back up to um, uh, our, our currency exposure, um, if you please, Avi. So one of the things that really makes us different from most of the other providers out there is that we're predominantly building portfolios for Americans in Europe. Um, so what does that really mean? It really means that we're concentrated on currency. And if we go down to the next slide, we'll talk about natural hedging. Now, essentially this is the MSCI Global Index. So what that really means is that if you took every company around the world, this is how much they would be represented in each region. 57% of the stocks would be American. Now, if you, Look at any US portfolio manager, it doesn't matter if it's Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, et cetera, et cetera. Most all of them will have about 80 to 90% of their investments in US stocks and bonds. This is what you call a natural hedge. So they over allocate to the US dollar so that you don't have as much fluctuation when the US dollar goes up or down. Um, the other exposure goes more into emerging markets than it would in developed markets. So the same thing happens if you were to walk into a Dutch bank or any other European bank. They're not going to only invest 14% in European securities because that's what the MSCI Global Index tells them to do. They would over allocate maybe 45 to 55% of their investments would be in euros. And that is what we're really looking at doing. We're looking at increasing our allocation into the currency of which the client feels they're going to need the assets in. And that reduces their currency risk back to uh, what it should be. So if, um, if you can skip down uh, actually to slide 45, you'll see the different brackets of how much we're allocating to the US in our different models. So you can see the US is still half of our portfolio on the left in euros instead of closer to 70 or 75% as we would have in our US dollar models. Now, many of you on this call are not gonna know whether you're gonna retire in Europe or the United States. So I'm gonna use a sailing analogy for you. If you knew you were gonna leave Amsterdam, and you didn't know whether you wanted to go to New York City or down to Miami, we would sail towards North Carolina halfway because until we get closer to our destination, we can tack either to the north or the south without having to cover twice the distance. Instead of going all the way to New York, 
and potentially that being perfect, but potentially having to cover twice the distance by having to go all the way down to Miami. If you're an avid sailor like I am, essentially that can be a good thing. But if you're just trying to get there fast, that's not going to be a good thing. So with this analogy, if you don't know whether you're gonna retire in Europe or the United States, you might just make a mix of it. You might say, let me put half my assets in the Euro portfolio, half the port, uh, my assets in the US dollar portfolio. And each year as I get closer to retirement, I might increase the allocation based on, first of all, views of the different currencies, but more importantly, based on your views of what the chances of you ending up in the US versus Europe might be. So using those abilities, uh, those, those different opportunities, you can go ahead and minimize some of those longer term risks. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we have each of the different allocations. So we have six different uh, model allocations to meet with each of these different currencies. We also have Australian dollars by the far chance that you're potentially going to Australia. And we do customize them for certain situations. So if you have some assets that you're bringing in from another account, you're able to transfer them into your accounts with us. And we can either put a lock on them, um, say if you have those mutual funds and we want to only think about that once a year and we would consider it against a current security that we have inside of the portfolio. Um, a couple resources to the back. We've already talked about ACA's website, but in the follow-up email to uh, this, we're also gonna send you an American expat guide where it's gonna cover a lot of the jargon. I know we only touched on PFIX and FBARs. I threw out a lot of acronyms for you so that we could cover everything in a, in a short hour, but you're gonna get this free document uh, that covers a lot of those things, what you do wanna do, what you don't wanna do. Um, Edward and David are a great resource right there in the Netherlands to be able to cover uh, the European aspects uh, of things. Um, but we also included an article right after that uh, that goes into why we recommend not doing PFIX, passive foreign investment companies. Um, we're not accountants. Um, so we linked uh, on, on the next slide, uh, a, a article. If you Google anything about PFIX, you're gonna find things that agree directly with that. And um, we also have a few other resources in here. We have our US expat directory um, on, on the next slide, which if you're looking for a US tax accountant, or a lawyer that deals predominantly with American expats, it's a great source to be able to find those uh, amongst a series of other articles and events. Um, we always talk about, uh, and if you can go to our YouTube channel, the seven things that you need to select a, a financial advisor. And one of the things in looking at the American side of the firm, so in ours is going to broker check, um, which uh, essentially is the SEC's website and you can look into the background and the regulation of the firm. Um, so you can look at how boring I've been over the last 20 years and the last decade since we, we set up uh, Dunhill Financial. A few last resources uh, is going to be the IRS's website where they have the full double taxation agreement. Um, this is a, a perfect place to start with where everything is taxed on the different sides and um, on, uh, on uh, the next webinar, we will most likely have a U.S. tax accountant that will be able to talk about those complexities with the Netherlands and, and with the United States. Um, that being said, we have hit our time. Uh, I know we have a few extra uh, questions on here. David, uh, Edward, do you have a few minutes to be able to answer these questions and yeah. say any final thoughts? Of course. Um, I, I did just type an answer to, uh, to Jeroen's question there. Um, so... Uh, Jeroen, I, I think you, you misunderstood a little. We're not based in the UK. So um, Black Swan Capital is based in, in Amsterdam. We're here in the Netherlands advising clients across Europe. So uh, we do have a sister company in the UK called Black Swan Financial Planning, but that is a completely separate firm and that is licensed in the UK under the, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, whereas we are licensed here in the Netherlands with the DNB and the AFM. Um, so the second part of your question about how Brexit uh, could affect European investors and clients, um, I'm gonna take away the, the 
the idea about him affecting investors and clients of ours um, because of course we don't deal with UK based investors due to our, our licensing and our office. Um, but yes, Brexit has been having a huge effect on investors over the last four and a half years and we expect it will continue to over the coming years. What we are seeing now though is that this, there's still a lot that we don't know about Brexit. At the start of this year, when this transition period came to an end, uh, there were lots of different competing theories about what was going to happen to financial markets, to different market sectors, to different types of industries and commerce, um, and to individuals who might have properties in, in Europe as well as in the UK, or uh, bank accounts or investment assets, whatever those might be. Now, some of those predictions, of course, have come true and some of them have been completely wrong. Over the, re the past couple of weeks, we've, we've seen the pound growing very, very strong against the euro and in particular against the dollar, which was very unexpected. Um, but it has, it has shown that there are still some things that we can't, we can't predict even when we know an awful lot of detail about a particular subject. So again, it comes back to looking at your targets over the long term, rather than trying to guess what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. Um, if you are an investor who has assets in the UK, then you really need to make sure you're getting very good tax advice, both in the UK and where you are a primary tax resident. So if you're living in the Netherlands and you have properties or investments or bank accounts or expenses in the UK, please, please make sure that you're getting advice based on that jurisdiction and it must be licensed in that jurisdiction. Somebody who is licensed as a tax accountant in the Netherlands might not be licensed to advise on those assets in the UK and the same with a financial advisor. If you're taking financial advice on your investments in the Netherlands, that advisor might not be licensed to advise on let's say a, a UK ISA or a UK pension, the same way that an advisor in Hong Kong might not be uh, allowed to advise on a pension in the United States. So make sure you're getting proper regulated advice from a qualified professional in your area. David. Yeah, very good point, Ed. It's a most important point. I think to, it's important now to summarise uh, what we've been talking about today. You know, it's it's complicated and complex when you invest anyway. It's particularly so, or can be for Americans and US connected individuals, as we're not only managing the dynamics of the market, which we've talked about and have been much more uh, uh, volatile in the last year than they have been in, in recent times, uh, but you also need to consider your, your tax residency status, which is different from your citizenship and any jurisdictional pressures or obligations that you have in different countries around the world. That is where you live and where you have tax obligations, such as in this case, the US, and to make sure you're compliant with those. Uh, if you're unsure, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask directly, rather than uh, in the forum here, please feel free to contact uh, us. Our, our details are on the screen there, info at blackswancapital.eu, and also to contact uh, Dunhill as well through their connections, uh, on the screen right now uh, through their website, uh, dunhillfinancial.com. You can contact either of us uh, directly with any specific questions. Uh, in summary, I think in terms of investment perspectives, our mantra is that you focus on your goals and your objectives and they should drive your investment decisions in terms of where you, where you are investing and where you are putting your money rather than what might be happening in the market yesterday, today or tomorrow. I think the long-term long goals should drive it making sure you're getting good independent advice and you have the right partners who are expertly managing your money in a compliant manner. Yeah. So thank you very much to everybody for, for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. And uh, as David said, we look forward to receiving your emails. And uh, thank you very much to Brian for joining us as well and giving your expert opinion on the matters at hand.